welcome to the Book of Mormon Evidence Podcast with host Rod Meldrum. This week's Come Follow Me supplemental study is Lesson 11.1, Jacob chapters 1 through 4, Be Reconciled Unto God Through the Atonement of Christ. Rod's guest this week is Robert Kay, a Jewish and Hebrew scholar who joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because of the Book of Mormon. He's an avid researcher of the Hebrew roots of the Book of Mormon, and when he first read it, he recognized it as a Jewish book. Besides having a degree in mathematics and an MBA, he has spent many years studying the Hebrew language and culture. He was schooled in the Talmud and several esoteric disciplines of the Jewish people. He says, I feel the Book of Mormon unseals the knowledge of the prophets of the Old Testament. Robert will be speaking at the Firm Foundation Expo on Friday, April 10th at 11 a.m. He'll be talking about the Zohar of the Book of Mormon and Saturday, April 11th at 5 p.m. be speaking about the Book of Mormon and the Science of the Fathers. Please join us at the Book of Mormon Expo. Welcome to another edition of our podcast here. This is the Come Follow Me supplemental research material for Book of Mormon evidence. So I have with me today a special guest, and we're excited about uh, this. Uh, he he is, uh, uh, has come to our conferences and has spoken, but this is uh, Robert Kay. Yes, sir. And uh, we, the, the lesson that we're going through again, we're assuming that you have gone through the lesson material, the lesson manual. And uh, this is, we're going to be talking about uh, Jacob chapters uh, 1 through 4 today. So let's, let's start off with a little bit of background here. Um, so tell us a little bit about about yourself and how you got involved with this. He, by the way, he's one of the really a, one of the foremost experts on uh, on Isaiah it has a, a lot of information has had much training about this so how did you get started well uh, well I actually <laughs> <laughs> I was not raised LDS uh-huh. um, or a member of the church um, yeah. my family was originally Jewish and we were Jewish uh, still Jewish for the most part I mean <laughs> um, my father's family was a Jewish family out of New York they came up from Europe and then my mother's family, my mother's mother specifically, um, her mother was from a Sephardic Jewish family that settled in the south, and they came over from Portugal and Spain. Wow. And then my mother's father was a Methodist minister. <laughs> so I got the so best of both worlds. <laughs> both, both, both of these had different cultural ideas. Huh? Exactly. And my uh, grandmother, uh, my mother's mother, did end up converting to Christianity, just like my mother did. Uh-huh. Um, my father never converted in that area. Uh-huh. Um, and so there's a lot of history there because being raised in the South and from families who had always been told, you keep these things secret. You do not tell people. They changed their names, like a lot of Jews did at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, we were taught at home, but also we had our, you know, we had our, my grandfather's family. And um, it was nice to have a bit of both worlds. It was, it was, but, not, but at the same time, it was also difficult because you didn't fit in either one. I mean, uh, yeah. um, not fully in either one. Yeah. yeah, and you don't fit in either in either in either tradition until I came across it just after bar mitzvah and after I read the I was reading the Talmud, uh, doing my Talmudic studies when I was, you know, fourteen, fifteen years old, and I was in a library and I came across literally a copy of the Book of Mormon. I didn't know what it was. Really? Yeah. Now my parents had so, separated at that time, okay. so I uh, my mother had gone one direction and my father was another, but I still was with both of them, uh-huh. off and on, and um, you're. Fourteen, fifteen. You it's said? about fifteen, yeah. About 15. And I literally found it on a bookshelf. It it was a blue copy, but you remember the old blue, or the, actually mm-hmm. the old, but the missionary copies, the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Um, but they didn't have the cover, so I started reading it, and I'm like, "What's this?" You know. And I'm and I'm huh. reading this book, and I'm like, "This is a very Jewish book." I had just finished, you know. I just done. A, of course, you know, you have to learn to read Hebrew. You have to, you know, my dad had me reading all kind of things. I mean, 13 to 15, that's torture for a child, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but but, but yeah. at the same time, I look back now and realize how much of a blessing that it was because it was hard growing up in the South where those type of things were not the norm. Mm-hmm. Mainstream Christianity is what ruled down there. Um, and so we kept to ourselves. My father was very private, uh, didn't mm-hmm. share his faith with anybody except us immediate family. Um, and when he did, um, and I had a stepfather that was had his issues um, with Christianity and, so, and had joined Mormonism. Oh, um, okay. And yeah. then, but I had to wait until much later to really get involved. And then I basically got involved in the church and then later on moved out to Utah. So how, how old were you when you decided to become a member? Um, well, I wanted to become a, a full-fledged member at 15, but it was actually much later that I basically yeah. became one. Yeah. Um, but I... 
I, I moved out here when I was 21 and then married a girl out here, had three kids, and stayed out here ever since. <laughs> well, we're glad you did. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Well, tell us a little bit. I know, I know that you've had uh, opportunities to even do ongoing study uh, when it yes. comes down to this. And, uh, and you were mentioning to me um, before the, uh, the interview here um, that you had just finished some interesting yeah. things. T- tell us a little bit about that. So one of the... One of the traditions I was raised with early on was Kabbalistic Judaism. Now, they're varying traditions. Most people, when they think Kabbalah, they either think something either New Age, Satanism, or something like that. But original Kabbalah is very ancient. And it, mm-hmm. is, it, it, it commences its origins with, it's it attributed to Abraham and Moses and the schools of the prophets. So my father taught me in the learning of our particular tradition, which was what they call a Hekelot tradition having to do with palaces literature, such as Isaiah, Ezekiel, and those kind of books. Um, there are other traditions. And so as mm-hmm. I got older, I you know went back to, again, more and more to studying Hebrew. I went back to studying the very ancient traditions of Jewish Kabbalah. Some are more modern than others. Everybody fights over who's the oldest. <laughs> um, but the commonalities are what is most interesting. But in all that, what I tell people, which is to me... A further testimony of the Book of Mormon is that if I were to distill all the the Israelite or Jewish traditions from ancient Kabbalah that we have, the oldest, I guarantee you, you will find them in the Book of Mormon. Every single one. Wow. In actually a more plain presentation to where it's meant to, it's still encoded. It's still done in traditional Jewish manner. But the knowledge is laid out in traditional Jewish teaching style. Okay, I, I think if we, uh, if I understand some of this correctly, the, the teaching style basically comes to um, some different levels of understanding. Yes. So, and uh, yeah. maybe you could expand a little bit more about what those levels are and, and sure. And the so, like with any 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 Israelite book, everything is if if it's a prophetic book, it's going to be written with four dimensions or layers involved. It's uh, it's. We, we, it goes by the term pardes, but P, Peshat, pardes, okay. you're literal. That's okay. your literal level. So in other words, if Noah built, a, if Noah built an ark, Noah built an ark. <laughs> you know, <if> Nephi <laughs> okay. built a ship, Nephi really built a ship. That's really what it means. It means okay. what it says. It means what it says. Okay. Yeah, okay. So you have that first literal, and it's actually considered, in a sense, the child story. So in other words, it's the the, the, the story or the account is written. Yeah, the foundational so storyline yeah, behind. So that a child could understand that literal meaning. Okay. Now the second level is what we call remez. And that's more of your allegorical meaning. And it also has to do with techniques of they will draw upon a verse of scripture or a portion of that verse with the intent of guiding the Jewish reader back to the actual verse in the Torah or the Tanakh where it came from. The Tanakh being the Old Testament. Okay. All the, the, the pro, so the Tanakh is, a, is an acronym. T, Torah, uh, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Uh, so Nevi'im <laughs> is the prophets and the Ketuvim is the writings. So that would be your all of your Old Testament. So the first five books is your Torah. Your prophets okay. would be like Isaiah. And your Ketuvim would be your writings, your historical writings, like sometimes Psalms, the Song of Solomon, those kind of things, would fall under those particular, uh, you know, part of, of what we call the Tanakh. So that that's, so that would be considered uh, kind of the, the level, the second level. Yes. Of so, understanding. Exactly. Okay. So it's more allegorical. And Dr. Er- Aram Giliadi that you've had on mm-hmm. here prior, yeah. he. Yeah. You touches on that a lot. His work, he's done an amazing work on that. I always love Abraham's work on Isaiah. But he touches on that level, I think, I'd say a good 80 to 90 percent uh, of using that. And, and, it, and, and, and it's a great way to teach the depth of Scripture. And he does a wonderful job at that. The yeah. third level is what we call drash. Now, drash can be, it's... The drash? Drash. Like, okay. a, like yeah, so drash. So uh, D E R E S H is how we probably spell it in English, okay. <laughs> but it's dr- okay. or what we call it sometimes droshing. You know, <laughs> when I'm talking to Jesus, we're going to be sitting around and drosh after a while. <laughs> but but uh, the idea being is that we're going to discuss things, uh, teachings from other prophets or precedents set from other rabbis or prior, prophets, prior prophets, prior prophets, okay. and then we bring them forward as part of a teaching. 
So, like, for example, one of the things in the book of Jacob. Is this to kind of draw honor to the original originators or kind of to give them credit for being the first ones? or It can be, but the idea being is that these particular elders or patriarchs or teachers taught something. And we want to draw upon their specific teaching to okay. bring them out, to apply it to our current circumstances and to help us to get an idea of what that scripture should mean. In other words, if we understand how it was applied to the original teacher, okay. then we can see how to begin to apply it to ourselves. And there's a little bit more that goes into it because it's a much deeper level because you're going into cultural traditions, precedents, mm -hmm. uh, edicts that have come down that most Western Christians are not familiar with. However, they are in the Book of Mormon. But like <laughs> one of the things that we'll, be, that we'll be discussing later on, I guess, in, in the Book of Jacob in specific, yeah. the parable of Zenos is a sense of using that drash level, as well as remez, to, to draw out an ancient teaching whose symbols are much older than Israel. Wow. Well, in fact, uh, just, just for those of you who are, um, uh, have the annotated edition of the Book of Mormon here on page uh, 80, 86, this is from 2 Nephi chapter 20, 25, and it's the first verse, and it really kind of goes along to what, what you're saying here. Basically, without a proper understanding of the, of the Jewish culture and traditions, you really miss a lot of the information available in the book. And this is what it says uh, partway down in verse 1. It says, For behold, Isaiah spake many things which were hard for many of my people to understand. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, how most of us basically feel about Isaiah. Right? It's, oh, this is hard to understand. This is the skip over district, you know, <laughs> you know or, or just breeze through it. And, and we've been encouraging people in the last podcast and so forth that this, this is the year not to do that. You know, don't yeah. skip over this. Let, let, let's do a deep dive into Isaiah. Exactly. It says, but uh, for they know not concerning the manner of prophesying among the Jews. Um, but but, but exactly. Nephi was taught according to his And he recorded fathers. his record according to that same pattern. Yeah. But the hard part about it is if we're not familiar with that, like you said, we read right over it, and we always stay at just the word-for-word that, word level, yeah. never seeing the radiance behind the word. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, and that's a very ancient symbol, the radiance, the zohar behind the word. Yeah. It has to do with that veil of unbelief, where that phrase came from, which the Book of Mormon is replete with. It uses that symbol from ancient Israel to explain to both Gentile and Jew, not just it's not one over the other. When you rend that awful veil of unbelief, then you will see the greater things. Why? Because the veil is your literal level of scripture. That's the Peshat level. It's what you read. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. It's mm -hmm. meant to be there. It's a, pro it's protective. It's actually as well first as instructive. Step. I mean, you really can't get to the yeah. other levels without that it, first foundation. Exactly. Knowledge. I mean, yeah. could you imagine teaching a child calculus and never <laughs> having had basic addition, a, you know, and, addition and multiplication? And <laughs> it's, it's the same concept, but especially yeah. when we get to the final layer of interpret or level of interpretation, which is the sod. Level four. Yeah. Okay. It's called sod, and what that means is it has those things which pertain to the council of heaven. Now, no one can ideally teach you sod. They can give you the keys to unlock the sod level, but those are things that must be revealed directly by God himself. It's to, talk, to the individual. To, to the individual or group of people. That's why okay. when it says in later in the Book of Mormon, um, they reveal great and marvelous things, unlawful to utter, or things, those kind of phrases, those are the things they're referring to. Is this part of the reason why so many prophets, almost every prophet in every dispensation has been shown and taught things and Nephi and Lehi included yeah. that they said well I can only tell you up to this part yes because they can't <laughs> our language does not have the ability to convey what they saw first off yeah. and then it, but what he does do and I know Avraham Gilead has touched on this and I really like it when he talks about this is the fact that what Nephi could not say he used Isaiah to say yeah, Isaiah 4 <laughs> but there's even a deeper because Isaiah has been that. given the permission to Yes. For the, these words have been given permission. He ascended to heaven yeah. in his vehicle of light, for lack of a better word. We call it the Merkava. Um, these are the works of his ascension. And these his writings are those great and marvelous fruits. But he had to, he did the in traditional manner of encoding it into literal historical events, mm -hmm. but written in such a way to convey much deeper teachings regarding, you know, climbing or ascending Jacob's ladder or the ladder to heaven. In fact, you were you mentioning to us uh, just before we started the podcast here um, that even, I mean, the whole entire, you know, the first and second books of Nephi 
yes. have an interesting uh, tell us a little bit more. I mean, you kind of you kind of alluded to that, but how it, how even First Nephi starts off. Sure. Well, the very I, well, the very first chapter of Nephi is an ascension experience with Lehi. Mm-hmm. A pillar of fire comes down and dwells upon a rock. Is as a Jew is your first symbol that the fire of what we call you call celestial, what you call absolute everlasting burnings comes down and rests upon the rock Malkut here on earth. Mm-hmm. So that tells me as a Jew, this is an ascension experience. And then as he begins to portray or, or, or relate his experience, his visionary or ascension experience, he talks about things that if you know those things that are attributed to the four worlds or the four dimensions, sometimes called the ten dimensions, depending on how you look at it, the way where, <laughs> yeah. how he ascends up, yeah, yeah. you know, of how he, he goes into the presence of God and comes back down. He describes things from those other heavenly beings and worlds, and you know that he's following an ascent up Jacob's ladder or the tree of life and back down. Same thing with Nephi. He follows the same pattern. But in fact, the entire first book of yeah. Nephi is your primer. It's an instructive manual written with an actual account, such as, say, for example, uh, Nephi obtaining the records of the Jews. Did he obtain the records of the Jews? Obviously, or we wouldn't have the Book of Mormon. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. But he's also, at the same time, teaching you the very first lesson of Kabbalah, of ancient Judaism, how to obtain the record of heaven, the Ruach Elohim, Ruach HaKodesh, the, um, the Holy Ghost. And er- each of mm-hmm. his... Uh, points of of his story that he relates are actually symbolic instructions to Jewish readers to prepare them to obtain the Holy Ghost. That be, and every time I, and he says in, the, in in that book, and my father dwelt in a tent. You yeah. are. I mean, that simple little phrase that appears out of nowhere. Everybody says, "Okay, great." He he, he, so, he, so he lived in a tent. Yeah, okay, he's camping. It. You know, <laughs> but to yeah. a, to a Jew, that means no. He's actually teaching you a temple teaching. This is an, a higher teaching. Because you mean of, what's coming after that? Or yeah, what or what surrounds said? that. Okay. It can be both. Usually what okay. surrounds that, but primarily when he says, and my father dwelt in a tent, then he begins to give you a discourse of, a, of, of something that happened in his life. But if you, if you know the symbolism from those ancient schools, you can begin to unlock the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon was a sealed book. Mm-hmm. And we think of it in a sealed book just like... Of course, it, it kind of still are. Yeah, as if it's... Well, we think of that visual because yeah. we think of, okay, so there's a portion that has a lock and key that we can't get into. Right. And that is true because there's a portion we don't have. Right. But the whole book itself is sealed in a Hebraic sense in that while you have the literal teachings, just like you have the literal teachings of the book of Daniel, right. the book itself is sealed or its full understanding is kept from Come. your from your understanding. Until, until you reach a certain exactly, or until the time is right, until God yeah. says the time it's time to do it. The Book of Mormon is no different. There are many sealed books. The Book of Revelation is a sealed book. Mm-hmm. Uh, Isaiah is a sealed book. Um, Daniel is a sealed book. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of us talking about too. things that are going to happen in the future, which all of those do. Yeah. Well, and it's even when it says, I mean, not even just on a prophetic level, which is a foretelling of future events, but it's also sealed in the sense that it's it is keeping in sacred hold, if you will, teachings that are to prepare the body of Messiah for the you know both the world to come, heaven, or the age to come, mm-hmm. the messianic age, what we call the millennium. Mm-hmm. You know, so those teachings are written, but they're written in a multidimensional format. And honestly, after traditional Jewish learning. And only those people who've had that opportunity to be exposed which to that, had. which I had, yeah. and there are other people too. Right, right. So, and, and, and uh, this is not some select thing. This is something that anyone can learn and should learn as they're ready to, to take those steps. Never leaving the literal translation, but looking at the little translation and then realizing there's also a deeper radiance behind the story. So mm-hmm. like, for example, is, is, like I said, is Nephi obtaining the record of the Jews or is he obtaining the record of heaven? Is Nephi... <laughs> Uh, is he actually obtaining the Liahona, true, or is the Liahona a representation of the Tree of Life? Because in Hebrew, the Tree of Life is three-dimensional, although it's portrayed as flat. It's actually a spear with two spindles or two legs. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and writing that it, and writing that connects all the points in Hebrew as the writing that appeared, the writing appeared on the from time to time to yeah. guide them in the more 
fertile parts of the wilderness. All these are symbols for spiritual teachings to help you get from your wilderness to the to land of promise. Most, yeah. to all the way. So like, for example, when, you know, when, when Nephi breaks his bow, did he really break his bow? You bet he did. But he also used that story to, to teach an ancient story about what we call the bow of hope. It's an ancient teaching on faith, hope, and charity, and how to connect heaven and earth using those principles. It's the same thing, did, did Nephi build a ship? You bet he did. But did he just build a ship? Or did he build a vessel of curious workmanship <laughs> to go from this world. It's also this said world. that the Liahona was, a, uh, was, a, was a made of curious, curious workmanship. workmanship. Yeah. And when you see that phraseology used, not only does it mean that it was fine workmanship, but that it also has to do with those teachings of those things regarding the heavens, the worlds where God resides, those higher things. And so in, in hmm. actuality, are we starting... So, so Nephi literally went from his, his Israel and Jerusalem to his promised land, and he's teaching us spiritually how to leave our world, in a sense, in a spiritual sense, and prepare for our land of promise where we come to the presence of God and we ascend as well. Ascension meaning not what new, what you often hear in the New Age world where they think they go like 500 watt light bulbs and, uh, and, do, <laughs> and, and walk on water and that kind of thing. Ascension meaning that you you are you come into a state, state of, of oneness yeah. or understanding or yeah. a state of oneness with God, which is the the full intent of the atonement. It's to bring us into a state of oneness, mm -hmm. and that oneness isn't just just a forgiveness of sins. It's an infusion by the Spirit of God into us to transform our hearts, so that mm -hmm. we begin to to think like God thinks. We grow, we mature, we become perfect, we become whole. In other words, yeah. the idea of be therefore perfect takes on a very different meaning in Hebrew. Instead of mathematical perfection, which the Greek concept of, of the word perfect describes, that's beauty to the Greek mind, mathematical perfection. But to the Hebrew mind, it's tiferet, beauty, or what we call in Hebrew, the secret of the Son, or sometimes called the secret of the only begotten. It's his, his, his beauty in that he has all the attributes of godliness and perfect balance. And all of that mm. are teachings in symbolic, you know, in basically a symbolic code, if you will, in the Book of Mormon. Do you see that? You said you see that ascension basically in, in in Nephi's life as he goes from being a young yeah. man and going through the the bow experience and so forth, and, mm -hmm. and he and getting his own witness and his brothers basically saying, "Hey, you know what? We don't get, yeah. <laughs> you know." We, we, we don't understand these things and he basically said well have you, have you asked and so it, it tells you that he's, he's getting more and more of his information directly from the source yeah he ascends the mountain yeah and he talks with the Lord but when yeah. he does that I mean we often miss over these little details here's Nephi in the land of Bountiful he ascends a mountain and he obtains instructions from God to build a ship where he thereby sails to the promised land now let's fast forward to three Nephi you have a Nephi in the land of Bountiful, who is at the temple, i.e. mountain of the Lord's house, uh -huh. who then does what? They connect heaven and earth, and, they, and the Lord comes into their presence, and they connect heaven and earth in and, and, and a Zion, if you will, in that air time. And for 200 years, for, existed peace. Yeah. Exactly. And so one is parallel in the other, but the teaching is basically the same, is that mm -hmm. here it is in symbolic format, and now here in 3 Nephi, you're seeing its literal fulfillment among his people. One is a shadow of the other. One is a, as an instruction manual for the other to happen. We just need the instructions. <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, let's, let's jump into a couple of quick things here. So, um, uh, because of the fact that we're kind of starting off here with the, uh, the Book of Jacob, so this is page 100 in the uh, annotated edition of the Book of Mormon here, and uh, this is the, the Book of Jacob. This is he just for. Again, for those who are just kind of um, jumping in the middle of this thing. So who is Jacob? Well, basically, he Nephi's brother. brother. <laughs> okay. yes. Younger brother. Yes. Okay, and um, and, and uh, this is the words that, that he was given. Did Nephi basically uh, um, essentially gave him the, mm -hmm. the responsibility to, uh, to, to record um, some of the, the things that were going on there. And so he actually records uh, Nephi's death, for example. Yes. And uh, some of the things that were leading up to his death. And then, then, there's, a, then there's some great sermons. And, uh, and actually, uh, the church has, the, in, the, in the new video series, have some great <clears throat> um, representations of those, of those uh, 
you know, discourses basically that he was, that Jacob was giving. But there was a couple of things that you pointed out um, that uh, this is um, came, this is from chapter one, verse one. It says, "For behold, it came to pass that fifty and five years had passed away from the time that Lehi had left Jerusalem. Wherefore Nephi gave me Jacob a commandment concerning the small plates upon which things these these these." Are engraved. So this is again. This is the small plates that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at here, and then uh, and then he said something. Uh, and, and you mentioned this before, but uh, as you go to verse two, it says, "And and he gave me Jacob a commandment that I should write upon these plates a few of the things which I considered to be most precious." Yeah, and that's an important phrase. So when you know, yeah. well, uh, in, when when. The books of the Bible, if you will, are, are named in Hebrew. A lot of times, like, we'll name them after the first line or first centralized thought. Uh, as a Jew, we name, th those books were named after those first centralized lines or thoughts that come forth. And like, for example, Genesis, Bereshit, mm -hmm. you know, Exodus, uh, Shemot, names. And why would it be called the names? These, mm -hmm. these are concepts that, they're, that these are ideas or centralized themes that you are meant to pick up on. So for Jacob, you could actually retitle the book of Jacob, Precious Things, or Things Most Precious. But what is a precious thing? That's what get people mm -hmm. think. Oh, okay, it's something that's very desirable, yes, but let's take it a little bit further back into the Hebrew. We want to go to the place in, in the Torah where that first it present, or the first instance of that word occurs. Precious. The word precious. Yeah. Okay. And one of the first ones that you will see, if not the first, if I'm not mistaken, is that with regard to Eleazar giving betrothal gifts for Rebecca to come to Isaac. Mm -hmm. So when it says precious things, it's referring to a betrothal gift or gifts. So in this case, Jacob's saying he's, he's relating to you things that are precious, or he's relating to you the betrothal gifts as part of your covenant. The Book of Mormon is a covenant. Mm -hmm. These are betrothal to help you to come to the bridegroom. Now the fun part is, now we have to mm -hmm. dig in and find out what are the gifts? <laughs> you know, what, what's uh -huh. in here that's a, that is a precious gift? Why are they precious gifts? And then of course, and the, the first big thing you get to is his discourse at the temple. Now there's a few things before, but if you get to the core of it, it starts, the, the outer la layer of that core starts with his teaching at the temple. And it draws upon many ancient Israelite teachings regarding found in the book of Genesis. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, when you, so when you look at the book of Jacob, look for those precious things. What are those betrothal gifts that you should be looking for? Because if there are betrothal gifts given there, it's something given to each of us to help us to, to bring us to the Messiah, the bridegroom. So do you have any any particular examples that you'd like to uh, kind of start off with here? Sure. So well, <laughs> we can talk about that. Well, lots of those. <laughs> There's actually more than one, but uh -huh. I'll, we can touch yeah. some of the highlights. One of the things is, is his discourse at the temple. So, for example, his discourse at the temple, which, you know, we don't know for sure, but there we know that it is a high holy day if they're all meeting at the temple. Now, okay. the question is which one? No one can tell for sure. There appear to be some, some relations to uh, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, or Sukkot, but we, we don't know for sure. Which are part of the seven but the holy theme, convocations of the laws of Moses, essentially. Yeah, so, the, so the, you don't know that. The, yeah, the high, yeah. the high holy days, the, the seven feasts. Mm -hmm. And so, but the idea being that this feast has a theme, and this truth is repentance and atonement. So that's one thing there. But in that discourse, he talks about some very ancient doctrines of which what was occurring amongst them at the time to bring them to repentance, they were the multiplying of wives. And which, unfortunately, a lot of people ask me this question. For some reason, I get, I get a lot of questions regarding that particular section of, of, you know, what were the sins of David and Solomon that they're quoting? Mm -hmm. um, why, why would God, I get people ask, you know, why would God, you know, say, hearken to monogamy, later allow plural marriage, then go back. And people mm -hmm. understand that you're, you're touching on some very deep cultural things from not only Israel, but from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that, first off, before we can understand his, his whole discourse, we need to understand what the sins of David and Solomon were. And, yeah. and that goes back to the Torah and the king's speech. So one... First thing is that you can't take a woman that's already married. That's considered adultery. <laughs> the other big no-no. That's a big no-no. Right, yeah, right. And the other one is, of course, what did Solomon do? 
He multiplied wives and he married wives outside the terms of the covenant. He did not bring them under the covenant. Mm -hmm. He married them. And so foreign wives being those wives who did not subscribe to the covenant. And by mm -hmm. doing that, which is, by the way, forbidden under the Torah. Right. And so these are all ancient themes that hearken all the way back into the book of Genesis, where it talks about, um, we call them sometimes called the Nephilim, those who came from above, mm -hmm. that they you know, mm -hmm. took the daughters of men, the Benai Elohim who took the daughters of men and a race of giants was formed. We, we, a lot of Christians read that, and I can understand why, but they, they, read, they think angelic beings came down from heaven, took daughters, and begat literal giants. And that could be possible. That is one interpretation. However, there's a much older interpretation that prior to Israel and prior to the flood and after Adam, there was a covenant nation just like Israel, maybe not called Israel, but a covenant <laughs> nation very, you know, that existed that were called the sons of God. And they took to Basically them... Basically the Adamites. Yeah, or yeah. or one of the, the, the peoples or civilizations that came from them. Yeah. And they began to min intermingle with the daughters of men. Translation, women from other nations, foreign wives, non-covenantal mm -hmm. wives. Non-covenant wives. And they began to establish dynasties. And if you look at the Middle East, and if you look at some of these things... These emperors who considered, many of the Oriental emperors and, and, and Middle Eastern emperors considered themselves Elohim or God, literal gods. They, they can, you know, to this day, even in Japan, and I understand Siam, at least the, ideologically, the emperor is considered a god, yeah. which may be a carryover from that ancient culture. But the idea is that these men took, they, these men from this covenant world or nation took these wives and began to form dynasties. And then later in the Book of Jubilees and others in the Book of Enoch, they began to consume all the resources. It's also interesting that's why mm -hmm. God condemns it among Israel. He doesn't, even though plural marriage was allowed under very controlled circumstances and only when commanded by God. Right. Um, these men took that which was forbidden to them. And as a result... They caused much destruction. They brought upon themselves covenant curses because they had taken things which had not been appointed to them. Mm -hmm. That's really the crux of the issue not with approved, Jacob. Basically. So now you have uh, Israelites over here, and God is telling them, for this covenant land grant, you're to hearken to monogamy. Now, if I, the Lord God, command my people to raise up seed unto me, which is a whole different thing than what yeah, we think, and that's yeah. not just literal children. Those are covenant-keeping, Torah-observant children. This is not having a litter. <laughs> you know? I mean, children that, who honor and obey God. <laughs> you know? And yeah. only, when he, only when he does it. Because even in this world that, that we see, there I know people, and I'm sure we all do, that still want to adhere to that particular practice. But I tell mm -hmm. them, it's like, well, let's, take, let's start examining the laws of God in regard to that. And if you can begin to keep one, the very first one knocks 98% of the men out of this world because it says you have to be able to support your family and not diminish your wife in the least to take another. Yeah. Now that right there is going to take care of 99% of the men <laughs> unless you're an oil sheik. You know? <laughs> but the idea being is that the whole teaching yeah. was is that he wants to bring his people to a state of what we call purity. And purity yeah. is what we're talking about. Purity isn't just necessarily meaning just moral purity, but in the sense of spiritual purity. So while yes, one you know the image of God is man and woman, mm -hmm. you know the man and wife. That's mm -hmm. the image of God, male and female. There is a divine feminine, just as like there's a divine masculine, and both need to be embraced in balance with each other. Mm -hmm. But in doing that. What he's explained to his people is you're beginning to engage in those things which brought judgment upon Israel. Dynasties began to be formed. Priestcrafts began ahead among them. And where does he condemn these things, even in the Book of Mormon? King Noah and the Jaredites. Mm -hmm. And where do the Jaredites get it? From the, their ancient records. And who is ancient, more ancient than the Jaredites? The very Nephilim, yeah. watchers, sons of God, whatever they were, that pulled the same things then. It creates a cycle of destruction. And what he's teaching his people there, and it's in a very cyclical manner that that particular section Don't is do talked about. Yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> you know, because it will result in, the, in your destruction. In your ultimately. ultimate destruction yeah. and yeah. corruption. Mm -hmm. Because you will begin to become corrupt in ways. And then if you'll notice specifically in that, in that Jacob chapter 2 through 4 area, notice he says what, what Yehovah, Savaot, will do to you if you do these things. First time, anytime you ever hear that Yehovah, Savaot, uh, it's a war phrase, meaning this is the war title of God, the Lord of Heaven's armies. He's going to make war against you. 
So if you do these things and you become corrupt and impure, then on this covenant land grant, mm -hmm. God will make war against you. If you do this in an unappointed way, and if you become impure, and it will that that phraseology is used, and do you really want to go to war with God? <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but it's true. I not mean, a good plan. Not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that, that, for sure. So, so that name, though, um, what does it? What is its English in, equivalent in the Book of Mormon? It, it actually says it, Yehovah Sabaoth, or, or Lord, Lord of Hosts. The Lord of Hosts. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Lord of Hosts. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, Yehovah Sabaoth. So when, you, when it says Lord of, Lord of Hosts, hosts basically, you're talking about this. Is, this is Lord the, of Heaven's armies. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're talking. We're talking. It's a military. It's a military. It's a military term. So basically, okay. he's saying you're going to get it. I will yeah. make sure you get it, <laughs> or the sword of justice hangs over you, kind yeah. of things. Uh, you know these these idiomatic expressions that you find in the Book of Mormon, drawn from the Torah. Many of these things are drawn from ancient Israelite culture that they would have been familiar with. That mm. we you know we read right over, not realizing the severity of some of these things. That God is not only saying not to just not do it. But that if you do do this in an unappointed way, you've got you're going to trouble major problems, and he's going to yeah. come after you. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's going to take you to task. Yeah, you know, and that's what he wants his people to avoid. Well, that's one of the things that uh, when you look at, uh, for example, in verse 16, it says, "Yea, and they also began to search much gold and silver, and began to be lifted up somewhat in pride." Um, he says that right after he talks about uh, desiring many wives and concubines. Do you think there's kind of a relationship between yes, getting I gold do. and silver and having wise and pon concubines? Because well, if that's a cultural tradition, is that you basically be, you better be able to support these mm -hmm. wives and concubines. How are you going to support them? You get, you're going to have to have some gold. Well, <laughs> King Solomon know? taxed the people to support over a thousand women. Yeah. Now, I don't know how in the world, he must have had a lot of great vitamins. But <laughs> all I can say is, at the end of the day, you know. Some serious Viagra. Yeah, so, right something now, going on here. <laughs> <laughs> There's something going on there. But yeah. if you'll notice it also with the Jaredites, he quotes the same passage. He also quotes this in the books of Enoch as well as in the Torah about these yeah. the Benai Elohim. The, they began to consume the earth. These giants... These okay. dynasties, these these mortal gods, if you, you mean will. They're using the natural resources up, or is that everything? Okay. People, resources. Look at King Noah. Mm -hmm. He had to literally rearrange the affairs of the kingdom so that he could then tax the people to support their many wives and concubines. Yeah. Because first they knew it was forbidden. And his, according. And his lifestyle that he had yeah. developed. They knew it was forbidden yeah. according to the Torah of Moses. They're literally breaking the Torah. By uh, by multiplying wives. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say people say, well, wait a minute, didn't Abraham have multiple wives? Didn't Jacob? Yes, but there's a difference between the taking of a plural wife and the multiplying of wives. Idea numbers for numbers' sake. They're creating a dynasty, mm -hmm. and they were and they were doing it upon the backs of the people. And the same thing here. They began to do the same things, and that's mm -hmm. why Jacob stepped in and put a stop to it because it seems to be both in the Torah the books of Enoch, as well as in the Book of Mormon, uh, both among the Nephites and the Jaredites, that those two sins seem to go hand in hand. The seeking and and, and literally conniving after gold, silver, and wealth, and mm -hmm. the multiplying of wives. And if you think about it, it would make sense because you've got to support them somehow. Yeah. And how would you do it? Well, one man can't do it, so I know, I'll take from you. <laughs> now, now, one of the interesting aspects of this is uh, that uh, when they went, because at this point in time, they are, they, they find themselves, they're in the land of Nephi. Yeah. Um, in the land of Nephi, they said that they found gold and silver and copper and ores and, and, and all kinds of animals and so forth that they were in the land of Nephi. Um, interestingly enough, in the, uh, in, in the research that we've done involving the geography aspect of this, mm -hmm. the, uh, the land of Nephi area would be essentially in the Tennessee area. Oh, okay. um, around Chattanooga, Tennessee, and interestingly enough, there's another aspect of this that they, that's interesting. The first gold rush of this, of this, uh, of our of our country was actually at a place called Duck River, and Duck Creek, in just outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee. You know, I grew up around that whole area, and I never that's, knew that. <laughs> Although Lookout Mountain was a great place to go. Yeah, Lookout Mountain is a beautiful, <laughs> amazing. In fact, uh, but the, I do the, understand, yeah. and this is something that was interesting. I was doing some research one time, and. Um, I understand that when they were the Tennessee Valley Authority was going in, they mm -hmm. found some ancient ruins before they flooded the area, and yes, they attributed they them to either Phoenician or Egyptian. I, and that was, and then you never hear any more about it. Yeah, and they also, they, they, I mean, this it was, a, they thought it was a temple, 
And yeah. in fact, it was even called a, a possibly a Phoenician or, or a Hebrew temple. Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason for that was because of the two pillars that were found. But you also had that, that, that Cherokee uh, nation in that area. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to talk to the varying bands of Cherokee because they do claim mm -hmm. Israelite lineage. Yes, they do. Which yeah, is the, quite the central band and also the eastern band of Cherokee. Yeah. Um, which is a, which is an official. And the only reason group, I know yeah. that is because my mother's father, who's not a Jew, strangely enough, it was a yeah. funny enough. His uh, paternal, his father, his father's grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee, and we have two Native American grandmothers. So I was always interested <laughs> in that part because I didn't know anything about it. But they all up in that area. And one thing I, that I forgot to bring up in that is that uh, your 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 family line actually goes back. You mentioned how your, your last name is K now, yes. but it was changed and so forth. But but the uh, but originally it was the form of Cohen. Cohen. Yeah. For, yeah. for, for a priest. Yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty yeah. amazing. Now, yeah. I, and it's funny because, you know, you begin to see um, my sister, my oldest sister, married a gentleman from Israel. He was a Cohen. And so they did tests on, we did genetic tests on both family lines and the Cohen genes on both sides. So it's just kind of interesting. <laughs> I, I kind of laugh going, it, 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 I think Heavenly Father has a great way of maneuvering families around where he wants them. Yeah. You know. oh, for sure, for sure. Now, one, just another one little point here, and on page uh, 101 in the uh, Annotated Book of Mormon, we have an interesting parallelism that's going on here um, that has to do with uh, essentially verse 11. Okay. It says, Wherefore the people were desirous to remain in remembrance his name, this is Nephi talking about, and whoso should reign in his stead were called by the people, second Nephi, third Nephi, and so forth, according to the reigns of the kings, and thus they were called by the people, let them be of whatever name they would. And it came to pass that Nephi died. So this is where <laughs> Nephi finishes up his, uh, the, the end of his record. But these, uh, this, this, this um, descendancy, essentially. Yes. And, and calling the, the, even the whatever name that they were given as their given name, basically, mm -hmm. when they became the new ruler of the Nephites, they took on the name of Nephi, and second Nephi, third Nephi, and etc. cetera. Um, and interestingly enough, there was a, there's a kind of a, fun parallel that goes on here. Um, a, a lot of people are, are not familiar with the, a lot of people are familiar with the fact that back in, um, in 1877 there was, um, that when they got the, the St. George Temple completed, this was before the, 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 the Salt Lake Temple was, it was still oh. under construction. Okay. And, uh, and we have uh, the account of the Founding Fathers coming to oh, that's right. the St. George that. Temple to Wilford Woodruff, right? And mm -hmm. his, and his, uh, and his um, not scribe, it's his recorder, okay. the temple recorder, and then he and they recorded all the, the names of these uh, of the the founding fathers and then all other eminent men and other eminent women and so forth from history, that 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 came to them essentially in in vision, and then asked for their work to be done. Mm -hmm. I guess they were, they were, they, they were so. Uh, you know, they, they wanted to have their work done so much they couldn't even wait for the Salt Lake Temple to get finished. <laughs> okay, so that goes dang impatient founding fathers. That's right. <laughs> you know, anyway, they said, Stop messing around. The temple's been done now for a whole, I think it was a couple of months. Mm -hmm. What are you waiting for? We're waiting to get our work done. Wow. So they show up at the temple. Um, what a lot of people don't know, um, after the, the work was done for the founding fathers, is about uh, about eight, uh, eight, nine days later, mm -hmm. um, the next time that they were actually doing baptisms for the dead, there was another interesting group of people who were whose names showed up in the temple registry. Oh. I found out about it because I had a friend of mine that actually gave me a copy of the St. George Temple Registry of the Founding Fathers' work that had been done in the St. George Temple. It's really pretty cool to see that. Oh, interesting. But then uh, when they gave it to me, at the end of it, there was these other names that were there. And uh, these other names um, were all names that I recognized uh, as being Native American. Oh, wow. I mean, you had Red Jacket and Tecumseh and, and Squanto and Samoset and others, uh, you know, just a, a, a whole plethora of, of these other names. Mm -hmm. But that was the end of the of the sheets that he gave me. So, so I, I asked him, so where's the rest of it? And he said, that's as far as I went because oh, wow. was, we were done with the Founding Fathers. Anyway, wow. so uh, what happened was is that uh, I went back and, uh, and researched this and got the rest of the pages, and I was just absolutely astounded. Because that day, um, there was a there was a guy by the name of Commodore uh, Perry Liston, okay. who was who was, and they and he and Wilfred Woodruff did the work for a whole other group of uh, of individuals, and every one of them are Native Americans from the northeastern part of the United States. These are all chieftains oh, cool. 
from the Onondaga and Cayuga and, uh, and, and, and Seneca, uh, they call them the Six Nations and so forth. But, uh, but in that listing, mm -hmm. there was a, a king by the name of Dadoda. Hmm. It's actually spelled T-A-H-T-A-T-A-H. And, uh, and I, I looked at, on the bottom of one page, it had King Dodota 1, King Dodota 2, King Dodota oh. 3, 4, 5, 6. And then it went on to the next page, on the upper, upper part of the next page. Um, hmm. and, 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 and actually, That's those are all Onondaga chieftains, and they actually go all the way down to King Dodota number 15. Wow. So wow. here's 15 kings. And uh, and um, we have a a, a lady who's a Native American that has has been able to re do research on on all the names in this group, and she's been able to, to discover who these people are. And it's just really an interesting thing because here in the Book of Mormon, they talked about that their that their kings in in succession would be basically named after the previous one, mm -hmm. and well, at least in, in Nephi's case, first and second, third, and so forth. Sure. We don't know how many. Times that con that yeah. continued on because it's not really recorded here um, in Jacob, but it's just an interesting little parallelism, and you can you can check that out here. And again, it's on page one hundred one, and the uh, the uh, attitude of the Book of Mormon. Interesting. Thank you for listening to the Book of Mormon Evidence podcast. If you enjoyed this, come follow me supplemental study. Click the like button, or share it with your friends. Be sure to go to bookofmormonevidence.org where you can buy tickets to the upcoming Firm Foundation Expo held Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, April 9th, 10th, and 11th in Sandy, Utah.